and Jackie is going to read God's word for us. The second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning verse 11. <clears throat> day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the beginning and life and love, there was a father loving his son in the joy of the Holy Spirit, and everything has come from light and life and love. And out of this has come a world that is destined to share in light and life and love. But you know that this world is not like that. I know this world is not like that. I look around and I see darkness and death and disconnection. Where's that come from? Well, we've turned from the light. And when you turn from the light, where else do you go but darkness? And when you turn from love, where else do you go but disconnection? When you turn from life, where else do you go but death? So this is the kind of world we live in. But what does, what does love do when love sees the beloved in trouble? Love says, your pit will be my pit, your plight will be my plight, your debts will be my debts, your darkness will be my darkness, your death will be my death. So who is Jesus? Jesus is love come down. The son of the father comes and, and becomes our brother to be with us in the darkness to take that darkness on himself on the cross, to take that disconnection on himself, to even to take that death that we all deserve for turning from God, took that on himself on the cross, plunged it down into the hell that it deserves, and he rose up again to light and life and love, and he says, you in the darkness, do you want my light? You in death, do you want my life? You in disconnection, do you want my love? And anyone who simply says yes to Jesus, we get Jesus in our life. We get his father as our father. We get his spirit as our spirit. We get his future as our future. It's for free and it's forever. So do you want Jesus? Let's pray, shall we, as we come to Hebrews together. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you that you're a God of love and life and light and that into this world that are turned away from each of those, you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, 
that in him we might have light and not darkness, that love and not hatred, and life and not death. Let me pray this morning that as we think more about Jesus Christ, you will warm our hearts, change our minds, and shape our behavior all for his love's sake. Amen. This January, we're focusing on Jesus and one way to slice the pie to think about how do you think about Jesus in, in some sort of sections is to think of him as our prophet. That is, Jesus is the only one who fully, finally, perfectly, gloriously, and completely speaks God's truth. No need for you and I to look anywhere else. We're not interested in something new. We're interested in deeper into the revealed glories and perfection of Jesus Christ because he's the image of the invisible God. If you've seen Christ, then you've seen all the glory of God. God has spoken. This week we're thinking about Jesus Christ as our priest and next week as our king. Prophet, priest and king, the three anointed roles in the Old Testament. So when we talk about Jesus as God's anointed, if you were to say that to a Jew in the first century, they think, oh, I know what anointed means. It's what happened to either prophets or priests or kings. Here we're going to think about priest. And uh, Glenn and I were at Bible college together, and uh, we've known each other many years. And uh, he tells you the story of the world. Let me tell you a story. God is full of relational and creative love overflowing as the love for the Father, for the Son, the love of the Father and the Son for the Holy Spirit, the love of the Spirit and the Son for the Father, mutually indwelt by love. And so full of relational and creative love is God that he makes a world, a beautiful world, full of goodness. He is not measured when he creates a world. He has no concept of it's big enough because look how many galaxies he made look how vast is the sum of this universe and at the pinnacle of that creation are human beings designed to live in relationship with him designed to live in relationship with each other and designed to live in relationship to the world so then in Genesis 2 the world depends on God for rain on Adam and Eve for tilling Adam and Eve depend on God and so on and so forth this relational and creative God of love makes a world that is a relational and creative world of love and it is a ridiculous and overflowing love in Genesis 2 we don't just meet a God who provides enough for them to get by so that he sort of invents cheese and pita bread and says that'll keep you alive we meet a God who creates a vast world with all the trees you could possibly imagine and says go and eat of them with uh, all the beauty you can imagine very striking in Genesis 2 I have on occasion uh, bought Katie flowers because my love overflows enough to open my wallet and to buy some flowers but in Genesis 2 you see that this God of relational glory and beautiful creation uh, creates a world that not just contains what you need to eat, but everything that is beautiful to the eye. It's an amazing gift of love to Adam and Eve, isn't it? Next time I buy a bunch of flowers, I shall look at it and wonder if it compares to every single piece of created beauty. That's what God made for us human beings. And yet, as we've been reminded this morning already, humans turned away from God. And when you turn away from life and love, you get death and hatred. I want to think this morning very briefly about three little questions. Why do we need a priest? How is Jesus our high priest? And then thirdly, about what difference it makes. So why do we need a priest? how is Jesus our high priest and what difference it makes I take it that why we need a high priest is very clear from our Bible readings both of them and helpfully summarized in what uh, Glenn Scrivener said look again if you've forgotten it down at the passage we're in Hebrews chapter 10 and look at verse 17 quoting Jeremiah their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more says the Lord no one is righteous not even one all have fallen short there is no human being 
alive on this planet today that you could put in heaven as we are now and have heaven still be perfect. Uh, if you think that you are that human being, I would be delighted to talk to you afterwards and I can recommend a great psychiatrist. None of us are perfect, are we? And the Bible's unashamed about that. The Bible's unashamed about that. All have fallen short. Sin is the reason that we need a great high priest. And all the way through the Bible, that is the clear problem. Their sins and their lawless acts. That's to say, sins are not just things we do. Sometimes they're things we don't do. Sometimes they're things we think, things we say. So the Anglican confessions are very rich, aren't they? I have done those things that I ought to have done, or not to have done, and I've left undone those things that I ought to have done. So if you and I want to claim perfection, we not only have to have not avoided a whole heap of things, but we also have to have lived a perfectly loving life to every single person that we've come across in a day. Some of us, I think, have grown up in churches where we were taught that sins were a list of things we had to not do. But to be perfect, of course, there's a whole list of things we also need to do. I have left undone those things that I ought to have done. And there is no health in me, as the Anglican Confession has it. We need a priest because of sin. That's to say there's a deep problem for each and every member of the human race. That is the holy and perfect God who cannot abide in perfection because he loves truth and beauty so much, has a settled anger at our sin. It's a deep problem and it is a brilliant thing to know. It's a brilliant thing to know. And I want to show you that it's brilliant for at least two reasons. Number one, if you know this, you have found out the worst thing about yourself and you can relax because no one's ever going to tell you anything worse than that. It's quite a nice feeling, isn't it? Every now and then people lovingly tell you things about you that are imperfect, don't they? Well, I presume they do it for your good. Uh, once you realize that you're a sinner and that the holy, pure, perfect, loving God can't abide sin, you have nothing to fear, do you? you you've learned the worst thing that you're ever going to hear in your life. And that's quite nice, isn't it? Secondly, of course, there's a profound equality that comes from knowing our sinfulness. Various different groups of human beings have kind of concepts of better people or worse people. You know, th these people are more compassionate, these people are less compassionate. These people are better, these people are worse. I in different groups, there'll be different qualifications for being better or worse. But the great thing about being a sinner is you know that you're profoundly equal with every single other human being you ever meet. You and I have never met anybody better than us, and you and I have never met anybody worse than us. Isn't that lovely? Some will be old enough to remember a lovely sketch, remember? I look down on him. Remember three comedians? Tall, middle, short. I look down on him because he is middle class. I look up to him because he is upper class. But I look down on him because he is lower class. To be a sinner is to know that every single other person you met, you have met, will meet, is your profound equal. You and I have met no one better than us and no one worse than us. That's why Christians will never look down on people. The true Christian will never have anyone to look down on, will they? Paul's very striking. Remember Paul describes in 1 Timothy, sinners of which I'm the worst. The true Christian who knows their own sin deep in their heart will know that they are the most ungodly person they've ever met. So you'll have no one to look down on in your life, and that'll make you a lovely person to be around, won't it? People will come to you all the time. They'll find it no problem to confess their faults with you in the room because they know that you never look down on anybody because you've known yourself to be a sinner. The glory of the profound equality that comes from knowing the worst thing about yourself and knowing that every single other person you meet is profoundly equal to you it's funny, isn't it, that one of the world's complaints about the church is that we think more highly of ourselves than we do of them.
But the church, of course, is not a hotel for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. You and I have a fatal disease. And the single most important thing in the whole of our lives is to be freed from that disease and have life and love forever. Why do we need a priest? Because of our sin. And uh, if you're here and you wouldn't want to call yourself a Christian, I think this is profoundly helpful for you as you think things through, as you're exploring things, as you're examining things, you're testing out what you may or may not believe. I think it helps you from our angle and it helps you from your angle. Uh, if you're here and you wouldn't want to call yourself a believer, you've often heard us talk about Jesus Christ as Savior. And I know that many of my non-Christian friends, they find that a really hard concept. Savior from what? I'm not at any imminent risk of drowning, so I don't need a lifeguard. I'm not at any imminent risk of financial ruin, so I don't need Savior from what? Well, today, hopefully, we can be really clear on that. We worship Jesus Christ as our Savior. We trust him as our Savior from sin. But from your angle as a non-believer, this thought is also very, very helpful. Because one of the questions I'd love to ask you, if you'll permit me to at the end, is how do you explain what's wrong with the world? It's very hard, if you wouldn't want to call yourself a Christian, to explain the deep imperfections that you and I see in this world around us. You could take a Darwinian route, if you like. You could say that stronger, preying on weaker, is how things get better. But you'll find that hard to believe as you keep reading the news. And you'll find it hard to express in good company, won't you? When you see stronger humans preying on weaker ones. As a Darwinian atheist, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. How would you like to explain what's wrong with the world? The Bible's unashamed. This world is brilliant but broken, marvelous but marred. And the reason is that we human beings turned away from love and life and light. Why do we need a high priest? Because of our sin. Let me just clarify before we move on. When we're talking about priesthood here, we're not talking about people who wear dog collars. You won't find a single word in the book of Hebrews about human priesthood, about Christians. Priesthood in the book of Hebrews is about Old Testament priests, we'll think about this in a minute, and about Jesus Christ as the great priest. So when we're talking about priesthood, we're not talking about dog collar wearers, we're talking about Jesus Christ. Here's how one writer put it. There exists only one priest in the full sense of that word, and that is Jesus Christ. The rest of the New Testament is very clear that all Christians are priests. So if you're looking for a priest this morning, you've got 80 to choose from, and they're all marvelous. Every single believer in this room is a priest. In fact, Andrew reminded us of, of that, didn't you, right at the beginning of the service? You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. And the Bible knows that as a kingdom of priests, we Christians, as priests, need teaching and training, equipping and encouraging, and that's why presbyters are set apart. People who live godly lives and have Bible convictions to train and equip and encourage all Christian believers as we service God's priests here on earth. That's the first clarification. We're not talking about dog collars. We're talking about Jesus Christ, the once for all priests. Second clarification is that priests had two jobs, and it gets a little bit confusing when this applies to Jesus, but just bear with me. In the Old Testament, a priest had two jobs. The first job was to offer sacrifices, and the second job was to make intercession, was to pray. Now, it gets confusing with Jesus because Jesus, as the priest, offers a sacrifice, and what is the sacrifice? And that's why it gets confusing. The sacrifice is himself. So Jesus the priest offers himself as a sacrifice. And then after the resurrection, he now ministers in this heavenly tabernacle where he makes intercessions for you and me. If you ever feel cheeky like me, do you ever feel cheeky? Does anybody here ever feel cheeky sometimes? I have cheeky moments, as some of you will know. Next time someone says, how's your prayer life? You could say, perfect. Jesus prays 24-7 for me in the heavenly tabernacle. My prayer life's perfect. Thanks for asking. How's yours? You see, we have a priest who works 24-7, standing at the right hand of the Father, who prays constantly for us. That's a good prayer life, isn't it? It's pretty good. Anybody here managed constantly to pray for the last 24 hours? But Jesus has been there praying for you. See, the priest who offers a sacrifice at the cross, where he gives himself up as, as the perfect offering for sin once for all, but the priest who lives to intercede... It's lovely, isn't it, as you lay your head on your pillow to set your mind on Christ, who for the next eight hours 
will intercede for you as you do nothing. Isn't that rather lovely thought? You have a priest who's gone through the curtain who's interceding for you at the right hand of God. Sleep well. Why do we need a priest? Because of our sin. How is Jesus our priest? This is particularly verses 11 to 18 of our reading. Verses 11 to 18 of our reading. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being, ho- being made holy. Just work through that slowly with me. Verse 11 and 12. Look at the Old Testament priesthood. Day after day, every priest stands. Whereas Jesus Christ, once for all time, this priest, and sits. It's lovely, isn't it? Lovely picture. Jesus does not offer day after day a sacrifice. No, so infinite was the value of his death on the cross at Calvary that all the sacrifice needed has been done. He hung on the cross until he could say, it is finished. The man who cannot lie says it is finished. It's done. Complete. Finished. And that's why he sits down. Most of us sit down because we're exhausted. But Jesus sits down because he's actually finished it. You know that feeling of doing some DIY? And at some point in your DIY, you sit down. But very few of us look at our house and think, I have toured every room and every room in my house is perfect, so I'm just going to have a little sit down now. You and I just get to the end of our tethers, don't we? We reach the end of our capacities, we reach the end of our patience, and we think, I've just got to sit down. But Jesus offers once for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. It is finished. So whereas those priests had to stand up and continue to offer sacrifice, Jesus Christ sits down, and he gets a great footstool, the summary is in verse 14 verse 14 because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy think about it the one sacrifice is himself death on the cross those who are made perfect forever that's to say that jesus christ death has bought your and my eternal perfection i'm not claiming that you and i are perfect now but it has been fully earned and will be applied at the right time Yours and my perfection for eternity has been bought at Calvary. And that perfection will be applied at the right time. And in fact, the verse notes, we are still those who are being made holy. So he's bought our perfection in eternity, and we're still being made holy here on earth. Jesus, therefore, is our great high priest, who's made the once-for-all offering, who sits down because it's finished, and who intercedes at the right hand of the Father. That's why, very confusingly in the book of Hebrews, you hear that Jesus is both sitting down and standing up. That's because one part of his work is finished. He's finished being the sacrifice. And one part of his work is ongoing. He continues to pray for you and I. Isn't that marvelous? The picture of him sitting down because he's finished as the sacrifice. But the picture of him standing because he continues to pray for you and I. You have a week where you forgot to pray for someone. Well, pray for them. But remember that Jesus didn't forget them for that week and praise him. Isn't that lovely? How is he our priest? Once for all time at the cross, he's made this offering, so he now intercedes. Verse 15, 16, 17, we saw these a little bit earlier. What does that do? The Holy Spirit, writing in the Old Testament, testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. You heard those words in Jeremiah at the beginning of the, um, just before our confession. Do you see what happens when Jesus saves people? He develops a people who desire to do his will. God's people desire to do his will. Some of us will be able to remember England winning the World Cup at Rugby Union 
and Twinkle Toes himself, Jason Robinson, was the fullback and a marvellous rugby union player he was for many years. He lived uh, not as a Christian and in fact he was a famous um, womanizer and a heavy drinker. Uh, but he became a Christian and he was asked what difference did it make to him to be a Christian. He said, before I couldn't say no, but now I can say no, and that is true freedom. Isn't that a marvelous statement? God had made Jason Robinson someone who desired to do his will, who looked back and said two years ago when they said, let's go out gambling and drinking, he had no capacity to say no to that. But on becoming a Christian, he suddenly embodied Jeremiah 31. He was a human being with God's law in his heart, written on his mind, with a desire and by the Holy Spirit capacity to say no. So that verse 18, another great summary, where these sins have been forgiven, there's no longer any sacrifice for sin. I love verse 17, just in passing. As someone who's been given a good memory and remembers many things I've done wrong, I find verse 17 deeply comforting. I wonder if you do. God promises that their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Sometimes we're slower to forgive ourselves than God is to forgive us. Sometimes you and I are still remembering things from five or even 50 years ago and holding them against ourselves when God hasn't held them against us for five or 50 years. So that verse 18, when things have been forgiven, there's no longer any sacrifice needed for sin. You might have seen this week the story of Oliver Mears, who's had a horrible last couple of years. Two years ago, he was arrested on suspicion of rape and sexual assault, and he's been living with that hanging over his head since July 2015. The case was dropped this week, just a few days ago, and you can imagine how that feels for him. Imagine, though, that he's been so used to feeling worried about it or anxious that the day after the case had been dropped, he turned up again to the courtroom your Honour, it's Oliver Mears here. I just want to know how my case is going. Oliver, I threw it out yesterday. I spoke it from this bench with this wig on. It is stamped and signed and sealed. You're forgiven. No case to answer. You don't need to come back here again. Do you see? The freedom that he has. I don't know the technical details. We've got lawyers in the house. You can ask them later. The freedom that he has. Case heard. Case dismissed. Free to go. Once the sacrifice has been made, verse 18, you don't need any more sacrifice for sin. Why do we need a priest? Because of sin. How is Jesus our high priest? Well, remember, a priest made offerings. And Jesus himself makes the offering and is the offering priests made intercessions and Jesus continues to make intercession for you and I so that when Andrew Towner sins in the courtroom of heaven Satan could accuse me of sin and Jesus would stand up and say father look at my hands the price is paid he is free to go he continues to make intercessions for us on the basis of his perfection and his wounds. So what? Well, three little responses. I wonder if you noticed in verses 90 to 25. You and I have three encouragements because Jesus is our great high priest. Three encouragements. Draw near, hold on, and meet up. Draw near, hold on. And meet up. First of all, verse 22. Therefore, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. That's to say, draw near. You can approach the living God of the universe, not confident in yourself, but utterly confident in your great high priest. You can bring your sin, your worries, and your failures 
confidently to the throne of grace. We're going to sing in a few minutes. Bold, I approach the eternal throne. Seems the only right hymn to sing at the end of this passage. If you've got a better idea, we'll sing it next week. Bold, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Our high priest is so good. Draw near. If you're anything like me, then you'll know that sometimes we can let our sins stop us praying. What fools we are. Our Father loves to forgive us. Our Saviour died so that our Father could forgive us. And the Spirit lives in us to point us to our Saviour through whom the Father forgives us. Let your sin drive you to the cross. Draw near. Boldly approach. Draw near because of your great high priest, confident in the cross. Secondly, hold on, verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promises faithful. Don't change your mind. Remain a Bible-believing, Jesus-trusting Christian until the day you die and you see him face to face. Hold unswervingly to this hope. and Don't put your hope anywhere else. There is no other way to approach God boldly and with confidence. There is no other safe way to die than trusting in Jesus Christ. Why do we hold on unswervingly to this hope? Well, we shouldn't change because, verse 23, he's faithful. That's to say, when Blencathra is the size of a molehill, God won't have changed. Do you get that? When Blencathra has been whittled down to the size of a molehill. God won't have changed. Draw near with confidence. Hold on. And then meet up, verse 24 and 25. In the Bible, sin is a deeply, deeply serious thing. And the more seriously we take sin, the more seriously we will take its solution. Here are some words from a professor who used to teach me. The the person who has been told they have cancer will hang on every word their specialist speaks to them. They will not go into the consulting room looking for entertainment. Their situation's too serious to waste time on trivia. And in their spare time, they will probably read as much about their illness as they can, becoming as conversant as possible with its nature and its cures. They may well alter their diets, their sleep patterns, and fundamental aspects of their behavior in ways that reflect the life and death nature of the position in which they find themselves. Indeed, the fact of their illness and the content of the cure will dominate everything they think and say and do. And that's why the Bible says to us as Christians, spur each other on and keep meeting up. I take it the two are very, very similar. We're to spur each other on, to keep meeting. We're to encourage each other every day, as long as it's called today. Because today, Jesus' return is closer than it was yesterday. Today, me seeing Jesus is closer than it was yesterday. We're to spur other people on. In our PCC, our church council, we've been thinking about the difference between a church that thinks it's a cruise liner and a church that thinks it's a lifeboat. You're on a cruise liner, everything is someone else's problem, isn't it? On a lifeboat, you muck in. On a cruise liner, you don't really want too many people on it, ideally. They rather get in your way. In a lifeboat, boy, is there room for one more, and you'd love to have all of them. On a cruise liner, when you're tired, you simply sit down and rest. In a lifeboat, it's life and death. And there are people that need saving. Our sin is so serious, so, so serious, that it's vital we spur each other on, that we keep on meeting together. I don't say that because I would like more people in these chairs. The Bible says it because our sin is so, so serious. Make it one in three if the diary permits. You wouldn't do that with your cancer checkups. Why do it with church? 
Now, because of our high priest, we draw near, we hold on, and we meet up. Let me just read those verses again, 24 and 25. Let us consider how we may spur each other on towards love and good deeds. The Bible says to you and I, how can you encourage someone today? Consider how you could spur someone on today. And let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage each other. I find that perversely encouraging, by the way. The churches back in those days were the same as, the, same as they are today. Because we humans back in those days were the same as we are today. But church is not a comfy club and a cruise ship. It's a lifeboat. Because Jesus Christ is my high priest who I desperately need. Who you desperately need. And who indeed the whole world desperately needs. Let me pray. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that your word, the Bible, does explain what's wrong with this world. Thank you that your word is unashamed about our imperfections. And thank you, Father, that you are a God of love and life. And you love this world so much you sent Jesus Christ to be our great high priest. Thank you that he offered a once-for-all sacrifice and lives now to make intercession for us. And we pray, Father, for each other. Help us to draw near to your Savior. Draw near to your throne, confident in him. Help us to hold on. Help us, Father, none of us, to move away from this eternal truth that gives life. And help us to keep on meeting up, to be committed to our home groups, to our one-to-ones and prayer triplets, to be committed to our Sundays, because we see the seriousness of sin. And as we see its seriousness, we see the glory of our Savior. Our Father, we pray. Please might your Holy Spirit change us because Jesus is our great high priest. Amen. Oh, yeah. I would just like to, um, if I may, read this out that I was given this week, which... Go on, then. Is that okay? Go for it. Let's have a listen. Um, Stand right if on. anybody is going through a hard time and needs encouragement... Yeah, people around give great encouragement. And I've, Jane's been an angel to me um, over the last week, as has many more of you has. But I was given this to read from Spurgeon through the week. And it's taken me from down here till up here. So if I could share it, that would be good. I will help thee, saith the Lord. Isaiah, I don't know what chapter and verse that is. 41 verse 14 yeah this morning let us let us hear the lord jesus say to each one of us i will help thee it is but a small thing for me thy god to help thee consider what i have done already what not help thee why i bought thee with my blood what not help thee i've died for thee and i have done the greater i will not do the less Help thee, it is the least I will ever do for thee. I have done more, and I will do more. Before the world began, I chose thee. I made the covenant covenant for thee. I laid my glory and became a man for thee. I gave my life for thee. And if I did all this, I will surely help thee now. In helping thee, I am giving thee what I have bought for thee already. If thou hadst need of a thousand times as much help, I would give it thee. Thou requires little compared with what I am ready to give. give. Tis much for thee to need, but it's nothing for me to bestow. Help thee, fear not. If there were an ant at the door of thy granary asking for help, would it, it would not ruin thee to give him a handful of wheat? And thou art nothing but a tiny insect at the door of my all-sufficiency, I will help thee. O my soul, is this not enough? Dost thou need more strength than the omnipotence of the united trinity? Dost thou want more wisdom than exists in the Father, more love than displays itself in the Son, or more power than it 
that is in the influence of this the spirit bring hither thine empty pitcher surely this well will fill it haste gather up thy wants and bring them here thine emptiness thy woes thy needs behold this river of god is full of thy supply what canst thou desire besides go forth my soul in this thy might the eternal god is thine helper fear not i am with thee or be not dismayed i i am thy god and will still give thee aid thank you thank you if like me you know what it is to be depressed and struggle then Spurgeon's a great helper because of course Spurgeon struggled much with depression and anxiety so when he writes like that he writes out of his own heart and in fact Spurgeon once said the Lord Jesus has given me a command to stand at the foot of the cross until he returns he has not returned so here I will stand 